So, um, hello and welcome everyone to our online discussion series called Reframing Reproduction, where we are going to talk about reproductive rights, self-determination and intersectional justice every second Tuesday from now on. I'm Jana Prosinger, I'm the head of the Global Unit for Feminism and Gender Democracy of the Heinrich Böll Foundation. And I would also like to introduce and thank to my colleagues Dilja Binischik from the Gunnar Werner Institute and my two colleagues in my team, Naida and Atna. And together we have designed this online series. The freedom to decide over one's body, own body and reproduction is still a privilege in today's world. And whether or not to have children and how to raise them is a very personal choice, but also a choice with political implications. These online discussions will hopefully enable us to look beyond the reproductive health and rights label and more deeply analyze the power relations and biopolitics and also the discriminatory structures that have laid the groundwork for injustice, anti-feminist movements and reproductive repression in today's world. We will talk in this series with activists, academics and decision makers on the topics of contraception, abortion, birth, reproductive technologies, reproductive justice as a concept, and today we will take a closer look at population policies. This event will be live streamed and also recorded. The time zone was selected in order to ensure that as many people as possible from all over the world could join in. Although it might be quite early for some of you and for others quite late and again for others in the middle of their work day, we hope you will all enjoy and be inspired by this panel. Each of our panels will begin with a guided discussion and followed by a Q&A. For French, Spanish and German speakers, translation is available by clicking the interpretation icon in the lower right corner. And um, now I have the honor to introduce our moderator and facilitator for the whole event series, Sham Jaff. Sham is a journalist and political scientist based in Berlin. She writes the weekly newsletter, What Happened Last Week, on underreported news from Asia, Africa, Latin, and Latin America. And Jeff is also the host of several podcasts and was awarded with the Grimmer Grimme Online Award 2021. So welcome, Sham. We are ha happy to have you. And I hand over to you from now on. Thank you so much, Jana, and um, a warm welcome to everyone. Um, I am so excited for this uh, for today's event, for today's panel discussion with uh, our amazing panelists. But before I introduce them to you a little bit, I am well. Jana gave a really good introduction into the topic. I think when I was approached by the Heinrich Böll Stiftung to moderate these uh, discussion series, I think population policy was one of those terms that I hadn't heard about in a very long time, and. Um, so I want to start with an introduction about um, this very complicated field, and I'm sure that our panelists will also um, will also shed some light on why it is so complicated and why maybe it doesn't have to be. Um, so I want to start with a with a very simple fact. Um, in 2021, last year, uh, the population of the Earth reached 7.8 billion. In some places on Earth, birth rates are decreasing. And then others, they are increasing. And there's a lot of debate and policy around that fact. Um, and today's panel is exactly about that. It's, it's, it's about population policy. It's about, um, it's a term that I, as a feminist um, living in the West, uh, particularly have not heard about very often, but has very much to do with feminism. Um, it's a term that explains all the different political measures um, that states take to change the size and composition um, of how many people live in which country, and specifically which people live in which countries. And um, so there are like a lot of laws, a lot of policy programs, a lot of campaigns that are being launched. In short, states, countries, governments, they intervene either by promoting birth or by reducing birth. Um, there's also another way to control 
populations, which is through migration and immigration policy. I myself have talked a lot about migration um, policies in Europe, um, but specifically with population policy, sometimes they get they they coexist together um, because you know they can depending on the ob objective, these measures can target particular social groups as well, just like migration policies. And the fact is, um, while in the global north, in the so-called global north and the west, people are encouraged to have children, um, in the global south, um, programs of so-called development aid tend to aim at reducing the birth rate. And many feminists and activists from those affected regions actually see population see that see that um, population control is it is it's in, in in this global south you know they sometimes see that it's it's a disguise it's a wolf in disguise um and because it is being sold as feminism but often those population family if had policies of racist of classist ableist um, and anti-queer elements to them and um and they also seek to perpetuate colonialist forms of oppression. What we do know today is that um, the issues of population policy and sexual and reproductive rights, um, they remain very controversial around the globe. And that is why we are here today in conversation with one another to shed some light on why something so actually easy to understand um, is well, basically the right to freely decide to have children, the right to freely decide not to have more children, um, and the right to self-determined parenthood, free from uh, repression and violence. Um, why are those things that are actually easy to understand, why they have become so controversial and so absent from our mainstream feminist discourses around the world, particularly in the West? So the Heinrich Bert Stiftung and I, uh, we warmly welcome our three experts on this topic. And I don't know why my filter kind of go, goes back and forth. <laughs> I think it's too sunny in Germany. I know this is a very strange thing to say, but uh, that is what I'm dealing with today. <laughs> but um, I'll try to fix that one once I um, have all the bios ready. <laughs> But I want to warmly welcome our three panelists today. Um, so first up, we have um, Setembiso Promis Mitembu, who's joining us uh, today from KwaZulu Natal from South Africa. Hello, Promis. Welcome to this panel. Promis um, is the co-founder of Her Rights Initiative. Uh, she's a feminist, activist, advocate for the strategic interests of women living with HIV and a researcher. Mitenbu has worked in the field of HIV and feminism at the national and international levels for more than 20 years. Her interests and in research are the politics of women's health, motherhood and reproduction in post-colonial societies. Mitenbu has also pioneered and led research and advocacy on the forced sterilization of HIV positive women in South Africa, which we will talk about today. She served as researcher advisor on the same, wor on the same work in Namibia, Zambia, and Uganda. And in 2012, Mitenbu served as a guest editor of Agenda Feminist's journal entitled The Politics of Women's Health in South Africa. She's also awarded a Doctor of Philosophy from the Discipline of Gender Studies in the School of Social Sciences of the University of KwaZulu-Natal. And her thesis is entitled, The Political Economy of Contraceptives in Post-Apartheid South Africa. Welcome to you, Promise. Thank you so much. Okay, the sun is migrating, so I will be migrating to the left. <laughs> Next, I would like to introduce and welcome Susanne Schulz. Susanne Schulz is a private lecturer at the Institute of Sociology at Goethe Universität in Frankfurt am Main, here in Germany. She researches power and domination relations around reproduction, human genetics and population policy, as well as social movements in Latin America. She received her PhD in political science from the Freie Universität Berlin on international population politics and women's health movements. 
As part of a research project, she worked on the democratization of the political in German family and migration policy. In 2019, she habilitated on biopolitics of childbearing at Goethe Universität in Frankfurt am Main. And she has taught political science, sociology, and gender studies at universities in Frankfurt am Main, Berlin, Vienna, Graz, and was a 2021 senior fellow of the Maria Sibylla Merian Center, Conviviality and Equality in Latin America program. She's an advisory board member of Gen Ethisches Netzwerk e.V., a member of the editorial collective Kitchen Politics, active in Netzwerk Reproduktive Gerechtigkeit Berlin, um, and um, in Femini, Feminist Initiative Against Reproductive Exploitation, and in other anti-racist feminist networks. She lives in Berlin, and I'm also so happy and so honored to uh, welcome you to this panel, Susanne. And last but not least, I'm honored to introduce Andrea Peto too. Andrea Peto is a historian and a professor at the Department of Gender Studies at Central European University in Vienna, in Austria. Um, forgive me, my computer is... Okay, <laughs> sorry. Um, uh, she is um, and has a Doctor of Science at the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. Her works on gender, politics, Holocaust and war have been translated into 23 languages. In 2018, she was awarded 2018 All European Academies Madame de Stael Prize for Cultural Values. She is Dr. Honoris Causa of Sudeton University in Stockholm, Sweden. And her recent publications include The Women of the Arrow Cross Party, Invisible Hungarian Perpetrators in the Second World War and Forgotten Massacre, Budapest 1944. She writes OPEC pieces for many international and national media. I'm sure you all, you all agree with me. This is a great panel. This is a panel of experts, a lot of, it's an amazing lineup. <laughs> Someone has written in the chat that I just saw. <laughs> and, um, and I am still struggling with the sun, but I will be going back and in, more and more into the corner. <laughs> um, I have prepared, in preparation for this discussion today, I prepared individual questions for um, the panelists because I wanted to make sure that everybody who is listening in on today, um, I, wanted to I wanted them to understand what it is that these uh, amazing women do and what there is that they can teach us about um, how we should think about population policy. Um, let me just try and see if I can, I, I'll do that later. I'll, I want to see if I can turn off my background so that you can see me a little bit better. <laughs> but um, I want to start with my first question, uh, Susanna. Your research focuses on power and domination relations around reproduction and population policy, of course. But in mainstream feminist discourses in recent times, we've heard a lot about all but one term, um, which is population policy. It's, it's something that we don't um, quite talk about as much. What does it mean? And where does this concept come from? And why do we not talk about it more often in our feminist discourses? Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation and uh, already for your introduction because you already said a lot of things about it. Um, I think um, there is certainly like a liberal or also a global north feminism, which is quite uh, reducing and decontextualizing what is uh, having children about and reproductive rights and often only looking at like uh, like at, at body politics, maybe at gender politics, uh, but above all about thinking of it as a private decision making issue of, uh, of everybody. Uh, so um, that we have a long story of uh, ignoring power relations. That's not true for every feminism. We have all this global south feminist history of uh, resistance we have now. I think that's also why we are talking today here with these amazing other guests also uh, about reproductive justice as a new framework, what is really addressing power relations also. And I think, um, uh, yeah, we have also history in Germany, for example, of uh, protest against population policy in the 80s. Yeah, 
So there is a lot of history, but uh, now currently there's a very individualistic uh, choice uh, oriented way to talk about um, reproduction. And we should really uh, think about that having children or not has to do with power relations and with government strategies, uh, addressing population, addressing who should be born, who should uh, re reproduce and who not. And as you already said, uh, this is a lot, uh, has to do a lot with uh, relations of racism, class relations, ableism, and so on. So uh, um, uh, there are always in, uh, in the global and also in the national levels, uh, government strategies who are thinking about how to uh, yeah, frame, how to change, to shape the composition of population and uh, the amount of population also. Uh, for example, uh, in Germany, we have a family policy addressing the middle classes to have more children. Uh, since uh, more than 10 years, we have like a parental allowance that gives more money to uh, middle class people when they earned more money. Uh, income related power uh, parental allowance called Elterngeld. Uh, and uh, people who are unemployed or have less money uh, get nothing or less. Um, we have all this debate about assisted uh, reproduction and who should be uh, empowered to have children also via a lot of technolo technological possibilities. But the same government in his development policy says we uh, have to make a policy to, yeah, to um, reduce population growth in the global uh, south. And that's an ongoing discourse. And that's in this course, even when we had Cairo, the, uh, the UN population uh, conference and one and two, um, uh, in uh, 1994. Um, we got this new uh, new words. Maybe this had, has also contributed sexual and reproductive uh, health and rights. This framework seems very feminist, very good. But in this conference, uh, it was clear that the goal of it is going on to reduce uh, population growth in the global uh, south. So uh, we have a, a very big, big, bivalent uh, way. Um, to address women in the global south, and uh, there's a lot of uh, we will hear a lot about strategies how to how to frame this in a voluntary choice way, but at the same time make uh, coercive policies, make policies very with the antinatalist bias, I would say, policies to address uh, certain women in the global south, especially black and indigenous and poor women, um, yeah, to to uh, reduce uh, births. And maybe as a last comment uh, um, is uh, that my, uh, what is important in feminism is not just to see these strategies or this power uh, relations on the concrete level, but also think about the narrative of population. What is population about? If we, uh, if we can frame every uh, social crisis in the world as a population problem, and here already uh, the problem begins because then we don't look at distribution of resources the way of production, uh, the fossil capitalism, the extractivism. Uh, we think about the, uh, addressing certain groups of population or amounts of population as a factor for uh, solving these problems. And here already we have the situation that it's not uh, all the population of the globe uh, of the globe is addressed is the same way. We have always selective ways to say who is then the overpopulation. And this has to do uh, with blaming the poor instead of poverty, or also as Michelle Murphy, for example, has uh, uh, said in her book, uh, population has always this um, grammar and also the ghost of, of, of racism. Po population is like a, a, um, yeah, a, a form of talking about uh, uh, world problems that is always connected to racist and classist ways to think. So maybe that would be my answer to your question. Uh, didn't bother wow. too much. Also. <laughs> well, Susanna, you've already mentioned so many of the things mm -hmm. we would love to talk about at length today in our conversation. You mentioned democratization of those societal problems. You mentioned racism. You've mentioned so many of those intersections that we want to explore today. Andrea, you have just recently published an e-paper on how discourses on demography in the European Union institutions um, have evolved and why they have evolved in such way. Um, can, you tell, can you tell us a little bit about your findings? Thank you very much for the invitation. Can you hear me well? Yes. <laughs> and I have, I owe an apology for 
you know, all the viewers that you don't have this background, which is creating this elusive image because I'm talking to you via my phone because I could not get in via my laptop. So, you know, if this uh, image is not that impressive, I'm sorry for that. So, I mean, you have heard in the introduction that I'm a solid historian who is uh, working on 20th century and history of war and by gendered violence uh, during wartime. So what on earth I'm doing here on this panel? And the reason is that maybe the commentators can put this uh, paper in the, in the chat that somebody else, you know, those who are interested could uh, uh, download it, uh, that uh, with uh, Livia Ola and Judith Goetz and um, Svante Höft, uh, we published a paper with the Böll Foundation about uh, uh, demography, how demography as a discourse uh, has been uh, hijacked by different political forces. And the reason, I mean, you did uh, Goetz is a, a researcher of extreme right, I'm also coming into this picture from um, uh, researching anti-gender movements and discourses of anti-equality movements. Uh, Svante Höft uh, is my MA student at Central European University in Vienna. So this is really the best thing what can happen to a professor that you are working together with your colleague. And uh, uh, Livia Ola is a, a professor of demography at the University of Stockholm. So this is the dream. And um, uh, I just want to say that this is also a, in brackets, that this is also a statement about uh, present knowledge production, that you have got actually four uh, colleagues who are working together in peace in a constructive way. So you don't have one person who is producing the knowledge, but you have got this group of people who actually uh, wrote this paper. And... Um, the reason why we were uh, interested in this is coming from two directions. One is uh, the, uh, the surprise that when the new commission was formed, uh, there was a commissioner of demography. And for several, this was a real surprise. What on earth demography uh, does as a job title? on the European Commission. And the other reason why we were so much interested in this, that demography and population policy, which had been uh, described so eloquently uh, by Susan, uh, they all have a progressive root. So they all came from, uh, in the case of demography, at the end of the 19th century with a zeal to change, to make the life better, to create a, a, a healthy, a happier society. And what we see now is that these policies are hijacked by different political forces. And I'm sure that there will be time to get in, in details about this, but now I just want to you know, highlight that these were the reasons why we wrote this paper. And the paper is based on the Twitter analysis of um, uh, politicians on the European level, members of the parliament, uh, important uh, NGOs, uh, different uh, institutions. And uh, I'm happy to talk about the findings uh, later, but just a kind of uh, summary is that it's really a mistake that the progressive forces let demography and also the population policy dominated, hijacked by the conservative and illiberal forces, by now mostly the liberal forces, uh, who are misusing and using the built-in contradictions of these policies in order to normalize certain exclusionary practices. And that's why this uh, uh, lecture series, a workshop series uh, is so timely because this is high time to think about how to take it back and think creatively about uh, these issues. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrea. I have to say when I read the e-paper, 
I thought the Uri paper was very timely because in light of what's happening in Europe, specifically in the West with all these new, you know, with the, the elections, for example, also in Hungary, um, I think we all agree that it's an extremely, extremely interesting and timely field of research. Um, and when I think we should talk about a little bit more, um, a little bit more in that depth uh, later on. Um, promise. In our conversation prior to this discussion today, um, we talked a lot about the term reproductive health, um, which you say, which you mentioned to me, is uh, used uh, almost only when we mean to talk about contraceptives. A lot of it gets lost. A lot of other topics get lost. Um, what else does the term encompass in your opinion? Thank you very much, uh, Sham, and to Cambridge Boyle and other panelists for this really interesting conversation. Um, yeah, and I think my colleagues, um, Joanna and Andrea, have you know, started to unpack this idea of reproductive health, you know, because it is a population a, a policy uh, and, and programs, you know, basically silenced, um, you know, into the health language, um, you know, silence into the reproductive, you know, language and seen as something that is always a positive, um, you know, but when you look closer at these uh, uh, policies and programs, uh, it says reproductive health, but when you look closer, it, it's really contraceptives, right? Because if you're talking reproductive health, you are basically talking about her reproductive health from puberty up until death, right? You know, but you only have contraceptives programs that are just about contraceptives and not providing for all other, you know, reproductive needs that she will have. I mean, for an example, things like, you know, cancers, I mean, cervical cancer in our context in, in South Africa and in the developing world, you know, this is a huge problem, you know, issues of menopause, you know, and, and many others. Um, you know, and, and as my colleagues have said is that, you know, contraceptives as part of the broader part of population um, uh, policy, you know, is really about state power that is imposed directly uh, on women's bodies. You know, it's presented as a medical intervention, you know, so you see it when you dig, dig deep, right? It's about governing women's bodies and deciding which bodies, which women can enter and not enter the institution uh, of motherhood. Because as my colleague has said, you know, these policies will promote uh, certain women uh, to reproduce and have children and basically oppress others. Uh, you know, unfortunately, the majority uh, of, of women. It is um, about racism, you know, and this is the, the situation, you know, here in South Africa, as you know, is the case in, in other countries as well, you know, the US, where this idea of contraception came from. Um, and was branded, you know, as, as many things. I mean, Margaret Sanger, you know, it, like people in the health sector celebrate her as, um, you know, a, a pioneer of women's rights, you know, someone who advocated for women's, you know, agency and choice, you know, but actually she was part of the eugenics movement, the movement that was obsessed about whiteness and containing the population of black people uh, in, in America. You know, she was targeting black poor people, the slaves, you know, with these contraceptives uh, 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 programs, you know, and, and, and because it's, it's part of racism, then it becomes a system, right? And if it is a system, an oppressive system, it has to have different layers. You know, it has to be embedded in politics. It has to be embedded in political economy, you know, which countries have power over others. So it will come as a form of colonialism, embedded in colonialism, uh, neo-colonialism, you know, and in our context, you know, post-colonialism, you know, and the whole sort of division of power uh, and labor uh, in, 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 in the countries, you know, you see the role of um, drug companies, you know, for an example, you know, in this establishment called contraceptives, you know, how, you know, these then will then be working with intergovernmental structures such as the United Nations, uh, for an example, you know, coming on board as anthrop you know, anthropologists, 
know, philanthropists, you know, the, the donors that are, you know, provide giving money in good kind to the United Nations. But when you look closely, you know, you realize that actually, you know, they are there because they have power over these institutions. I was telling you um, an example of um, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, for an example, you know, that they donate 10% um, of core cost uh, of the World Health Organization at any given year, right? You know, and over and above that, they have endowments that are, uh, uh, you know, set aside for WHO, you know, and that gives them power over how WHO drafts their policy. For an example, the global contraceptives policy now, which WHO is pursuing, the Family Planning 2020, that policy was advocated for, drawn and funded uh, by Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, you know, and WHO basically had to, you know, sign on on it, you know, and when you look closer, you then realize that at about the same time, you know, Bill Gates had invested in Pfizer, which is a drug company that is producing one of the contraceptives called Deprovera, you know, countries in, you know, Europe, America, Canada have sued, you know, on Deprovera. There's been a plethora of class actions on the Propovera since the 1970s. You know, however, you know, Pfizer are producing these contraceptives, which gets distributed in developing countries, embedded in aid. Um, you see, you know, the, the sustainable development goals, for an example, they also have, you know, contraceptives. So they're distributing it in mass, and they are also innovating it, you know, in, in other forms, you know, because basically now Bill Gates is in charge, you know, of, of global health, right? Um, you know, and obviously the uh, income and shares and everything else um, is, uh, is is increasing, you know. So yeah, so I mean to I mean to us, the, this is what this is about, you know. Of course, you will find certain women and women of a particular class who will say contraceptives are good, you know, because. You know, for some women, it does allow them to exercise their, you know, reproductive rights, you know. And in some instances, you know, you find that maybe there is a paradox here, you know, but when you look at the bigger goal, this had nothing to do with, with women's rights. Uh, my colleague Johanna was talking about how they attach themselves, like in all the discourses uh, and the ideologies, you know, uh, of the world. I mean, for an example, the, 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 the 1994 ICDP conference, which was about liberation uh, of women, women exercising their rights, you know, they basically took over, you know, and, and feminists who participated that they really had to, you know, compromise, you know, come up with compromised language. But, you know, actually the population control establishment had taken over that, you know, that particular conference. Um, so you look like in South Africa, for an example, they were able to uh, attach this ideology to the Union of South Africa, uh, oppressive system that was led by the United Kingdom. And they did exactly the same with the apartheid political system of South Africa. You know, it worked best for them. You look at what is happening in Israel and in Palestine, and they are able to attach themselves to those particular, you know, discourses. You know, we have a COVID uh, epidemic now. They've taken it over. So. Analysis of, you know, post-COVID world from a, a, a woman's perspective, gender perspective, contraceptives. You know, <laughs> you will see in U Ukraine, solidarity goes to my colleagues from Eastern Europe. You know, post-Ukraine war developments, you know, the international community will be talking about contraceptives. You know, let, let's help the poor so that they reproduce less because if they over reproduce, you know, then we, we have problems, you know, instead of addressing the real uh, 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 problems. Um, yeah, I think I'll, I'll stop there for now and allow <laughs> the other colleagues, you know, to, to share as well. Thank you so much for yeah. sharing your thoughts. Can I, can I just jump yes. in or? Yes, of course, sure. You, you encourage me in the preparatory meeting to, you know, jump in. So I just want to, you know, bring in one example, what uh, um, Promise was mentioning about Ukraine. And uh, so those women who were raped uh, and they are fleeing uh, because of this unwanted uh, pregnancy to Poland, Slovakia, uh, then they have serious issues of uh, 
uh, exercising their reproductive rights because in those countries, uh, uh, abortion is uh, impossible. So uh, in a sense, I just would like to, you know, give a different uh, framing of this uh, discussion and thinking about, you know, reproductive rights, again, not as necessarily as a choice, but uh, something which is uh, connected to the present uh, political, geopolitical conflict. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, um, that's a very, very important way to reframe as well. Um, and just like Andrea did, Susanna and Thomas, please, please feel free to jump in in any, any moment of the discussion. Um, uh, also, a quick note to our audience, if you have any questions whatsoever, um, the team will be collecting your questions and uh, we have a lot of time for your questions. If there is anything that you would like to uh, go in a little bit deeper in, um, feel free to, to ask, whatever. Susanna, I think you've unmuted yourself. <laughs> no. No, no. Okay. Well, I was going to come, uh, I was, I, I had a question for you, actually, mm -hmm. because Promise had just stopped at the, well, at the idea of the, the myth of the overpopulation. I say myth of overpopulation because it is a myth, right? Can yeah. you tell us a little yeah, bit I can, about can, that? Can, yeah. Yeah. Uh, is it a <laughs> thing? Is it a, is it a <laughs> real argument that people are making? No, it's not a real argument because it's like, uh, it's uh, separating the fact of population from resources, from our living conditions of, of uh, re social relations, uh, and uh, making uh, from numbers like uh, yeah, saying then we we can uh, we can uh, we can plan the optimum population for the globe. What's not possible, and say then we, uh, there's an excess population, and this is the overpopulation. But if you look at the way the narratives, the measurements, how this is done. It's always very reductionist. This is always looking at population as a variable and separating numbers of people from their social living conditions, from their, uh, yeah, uh, from, from every uh, structural uh, situation of power relation of this globe. So I, I think it's a way instead of uh, looking at poverty, looking at the poor, blaming the poor instead of poverty. And uh, there's a lot of, uh, reductionist uh, thinking with um, demography, as uh, Andrea already said, this uh, demographization always means to put the factor of population in the, uh, in the, in the front and uh, to make of social crisis demographic crisis. And this translation always is already the problem because it addresses always some groups of people instead of the social structures to be solved. Yeah. But maybe I could also uh, go on with some, some thoughts I had. Um, uh, thank you very much for Promise and Andrea. I also wanted to comment about um, our experience here in, in Berlin uh, that uh, Women in Exile, one uh, refugee women uh, organization told us that often uh, women they, they know coming, fleeing and migrating uh, in a very hard way to, to come here, uh, have an implant implanted in their, in their arms uh, from some refugee camps. Uh, also in the uh, saying you need in your, um, in your migration process, you need this hormonal implant uh, hindering to get children on the way. And this is uh, shown as a empowering uh, uh, um, thing, but uh, they have often problems to remove this implant when they are here. And uh, this is another example, as said, uh, Promise already told us, another example of this um, very uh, pharmaceutical-led um, uh, form of new uh, population policies we are currently observing with the Family Planning 2020, as Promise mentioned as a, like a public-private partnerships between governments and pharmaceutical industry and also this philanthropic capitalist foundations like uh, the Gates Foundations especially. And they together have like a very technocratic uh, uh, way to think how to solve uh, uh, every problem in the world by um, uh, focusing really on family planning and on contraceptives and to distribute more contraceptives. Um, and I could also um, yeah, give you some examples for it if I can show you some screen. I don't know if you have time for this. <laughs> yeah. Yes, please. Examples okay. are always and welcome. I, uh, I will, uh, because it's important also to show what happened um, a little bit in the past with these programs and to today. I wanted to show you, let's see if it's possible. Can you see this now? 
Okay. I wanted to mention that uh, there's a story also immediately after the Cairo conference, as Thomas told us, was uh, yeah, uh, hijacking some of the feminist language and a lot of big NGOs, feminist health NGOs said, now we have Cairo, now we have reproductive health and rights. So they didn't consider what happened in Peru in these times. Uh, immediately after the Cairo conference, there was a big uh, sterilization campaign under an authoritarian government of Fukimori. Uh, especially addressed to indigenous and uh, rural women, and uh, 300,000 people were sterilized, often under coercive situations, like uh, uh, saying to the health workers they have to make certain quotas uh, of sterilization every month, uh, uh, saying to the women you will seen as subversive if you don't comply, if you don't get sterilized, or you don't get any more food aid, or even uh, without informing during C-section to do these sterilizations. And we have a very long time uh, tried to protest against it uh, in the 90s. I got to know about that in the 90s. And we see also in Peru, there have been protests. But to show you uh, what, um, oh, let me see now the, the presentation first, um, um, what the German government said about this. When we asked them to uh, what happens there, they say, ah, oh, that's a, the main objective of the country program, the German government says, is to support the Peruvian government's implementation of its national population program in order to meet the unmet demands for reproductive health service, promote gender equality, and encourage responsible sexual behavior among adolescents. Responsible is very often also a, a means to, uh, to uh, make certain normative ideas how, to, uh, how people have to behave and uh, plan their, their, their children. And the next uh, sentence was this relationship between a country's population development on the one hand and its social, economic, and ecological development on the other is obvious. They even don't have to explain why this is uh, connected. Yeah? That the population narrative is so hegemonic that they even didn't have to explain. Then they said developing countries cannot therefore not to desist from uh, they can't, can't uh, they, they can't desist, it's, uh, it's a wrong uh, translation, they can't desist from developing population policy strategies and partly with the help of German Development Corporation to implement them. So they say it's a necessary um, strategy to do this. Um, and I have another example, Promise already told a lot about it, but I would uh, show you also what's happening there. It's the Belinda, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation who did this implant access. Uh, program so, um, promise told us about the Depo Provera part and Pfizer, and in Germany we should also mention Bayer Health uh, Care um, company Bayer as a company producing Jadel producing these hormonal implants, and there was a really strong uh, investments in the recent years to really uh, increase above all this implant program. Implant program means that you have five years implanted this. Um, uh, this hormonal implant, as for example, the Jadel, the project, uh, product of uh, biohealthcare. And we see here on the right side, uh, this uh, statistics, uh, how they increased uh, the share of this implant of all uh, contraceptives used, and especially in which countries they did. It's sub-Saharan African countries where they focus on, uh, and uh, they want really uh, to have the maximum uh, uh, yeah, a share rate of contraceptive used and above all implants used. And um, that has nothing to do with uh, uh, free decision making. Uh, we all fight, I think we all here fight for free access to uh, contraceptives in a basic uh, healthcare setting, to, to free access to abortion. But uh, within healthcare, within broader healthcare, as I promised said, uh, within broader reproductive healthcare, and uh, with a goal just to make it possible if a person wants it, if a woman wants it, but not as a goal to make development uh, policies connected to these goals, because then we have this coercive situations, and we have really uh, yeah, uh, the way to, to put these implants, uh, which are have uh, side effects, which often makes my migraine, makes... Uh, makes uh, irregular bleeding, uh, makes um, depression, weight gain, and so on. So women in a hard living situation have this problem, and they often can't get it removed uh, before, uh, before this five years. Uh, so we have all these uh, effects, direct coercive effects of this type of thinking. Mm -hmm. so Thank you so much, Susanne, for all these um, yeah, ample examples. Um, 
promise in a lot of ways reproductive self-determination has also been taken away from a lot of women um, in South Africa. Um, when, I mean, you, your focus and your research has also been on, um, on the forced sterilization campaigns uh, of HIV positive women in um, South Africa. When did the country engage in forced sterilization? And um, how did the country get involved in, in this campaign? You're on mute, promise, sorry. <laughs> yes. Yeah, uh, Suzanne, so um, the implants. Yeah, so much to say, you know, about them, you know, their relationship to Depro Provera, you know, the forced, uh, you know, implants, women that are targeted, you know, and also the fact that on the ground, health workers are trained and licensed to in, in, insert them, but not trained and licensed to, you know, to take them out if women choose, um, you know, you know, to take them out. And the recent case, uh, which was settled, um, on implants on their side effects in Canada, you know, yet the rate of uptake is, you know, going up, you know, in, in countries like ours. So first, uh, sterilizations in South Africa, um, it, it, the source is really the, the eugenics movement of late 1960s uh, into um, 1970s. Um, and how did it come about in South Africa? So around uh, the 19, you know, 50, no, 1960s and early 70s, um, and uh, the, 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 no, 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 in the 19, late 1940s into 1950s in South Africa. So you had the government of the Union of South Africa, which was led by the British and, and also local, you know, uh, politicians as it were, uh, white politicians, Africaners. They identified a problem, uh, a population program, a population problem that black South Africans, the population of black South Africans was increasing in urban areas, you know, and, uh, you know, black people had started to challenge, you know, power, oppressive power over them, you know, so they needed to come up with a strategy, a policy that would decrease um, black population in urban areas and increase white population uh, in, in, in urban areas. You know, at that point, the rate of reproduction for white South African women was two, and for black South African urban women, it was six. So it was becoming problematic. You know, and also they identified a problem which they called the white poor problem, where they were realizing that poor white people were actually reproducing more than, you know, non-poor white, you know, uh, people and that poor white people were closer to black people, right? They were beginning to have, you know, relations, married black people were identifying more with, with black people, you know, so also this policy was to target poor white and colored people, you know, so that they do not reproduce because they, re re you know, producing this undesired and pure, you know, white race and that, that has a direct political implications. So it was for, you know, racial policy, uh, purity, and, you know, clear-cut political uh, management. You know, then in 1948, the apartheid state takes over, and the apartheid uh, state, in as far as population and reproduction is concerned, you know, then draft a policy, which was codified in 1974. So the union went to as far as, you know, clearing the ideology and creating the environment. Then the apartheid state comes up with this policy in 1990, in, in 1974, right? Uh, it's population control policy, but it's sometimes called the women's health policy. So basically this population says, you target black African women in urban areas with an injection called the Propovera and also with force, with, yeah, with sterilization, forced sterilizations. You know, they inject so much money on this policy. They build clinics, you know, everywhere, which are called women's health uh, clinics. But actually, they provide no service other than contraceptives, um, you know, services. So women are targeted post labor wards. You know, you, you cannot go to door number two before you pass, you know, this particular clinic. And they were also in the city centers, you know, and I'm afraid that they were still there. 
you know, and massive investments uh, in, um, you know, marketing and, 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 and communication. You know, and of course, I mean, funding for this was not only coming from the apartheid state, you know, it was coming from international uh, donors, you know, and the program would obviously be certified by, you know, um, is it IPPF, you know, Population Council, you know, such uh, organizations. So that's where the technical expertise and, you know, and obviously the, the commodities, you know, the depot of Provera itself. I mean, it was, you know, coming from Pfizer, negotiated through very dodgy, um, you know, deals with South African ambassadors, you know, in the United States and, you know, in other countries where they were, um, uh, 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 you know, the, where they were producing the, the drugs, you know, and some of these contracts for depot Provera, for an example, the country still stuck with them because they were long-term and uh, binding. You know, and then fast forward to the transition from apartheid to South Africa, you know, because the, the forced sterilization that we're working on, we're struggling with now is sterilization of HIV positive women, but this is something that happens in the democratic South Africa, the people South Africa. So this is what happens in the negotiations, you know, in, in the transition. So you have the African National Congress, which is a nationalist party that ushered South Africa from apartheid to post apartheid. So the ANC um, in late 1980s rejects feminisms as a tool of analysis of oppression, right? Um, you know, they say all oppression is racial. Let, let's deal with racial oppression. You know, you are distracting us if you want to apply the feminist lens. And what this does is that it silences all women's issues, you know, that has to do with being a woman, but also with being, you know, black and also with being born and living in South Africa. So women's issues, gender is silenced completely, you know, from the struggle when, you know, at the critical point where negotiations uh, were, were starting, you know, so obviously in that context, um, you know, women's issues would not then be profiled as issues uh, of oppression. I mean, for an example, the rape of women in South Africa and outside of South Africa, and also, you know, during this, the, the struggle, and of course, forced contraception and forced uh, 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 sterilizations. You then have the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which is like, you know, your transition tool, you know, that is saying this is what happened and this is how we move on. So it leaves out forced sterilizations, right? You know, and remember at the time, you know, in international law, forced sterilization was already, you know, so one of the worst forms uh, of violence uh, against women, but also torture, you know, so the highest, you know, grade of human rights violations as it were. So it gets left out, you know, then the ANC through President Mpegi issues one blanket statement that is apologizing to all South African women who faced violation uh, in apartheid South Africa. Uh, you know, so, so, so that's one, you know, and obviously, you know, into, uh, you know, post-apartheid South Africa now, we have women in parliaments, we have, you know, um, you know, activism, women's issues going in, you know, but then when you look close, you realize that actually the women who went to parliament, I'm sorry to, 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 to say this colleagues, is that, you know, they probably went in there as female bodies representing their political parties rather than representing the interest uh, of women, right? Because they'd been silenced even before, you know, black people took over government, you know, so they're not representing women's interests. They, you know, just female bodies, the politics of cultures, right? You know, so they are not able to raise these issues, although some of them were personally affected by these particular issues, right? And then obviously in the negotiations, it's post-1994, right? The ICDP, the world is on stereotypes, you know, about, you know, ICDP, we're preparing for, for, for BG. So the country and the transition uh, process is littered by the United Nations technocrats, experts, you know, the United Nations, UNFPA, everybody is assisting South Africa to write these policies, you know. And of course, the policies are not going to look at the past, the policies are about how do we assist you to control your population, right? You know, and yes, yeah. 
Then immediately after that, you have the HIV AIDS issue coming up immediately after, like during the transition honeymoon, as it were, 1993, 1994, then you have HIV positive women targeted for sterilizations. So uh, the organization that I belong to, Her Rights Initiative, will represent over eight HIV positive women who are victims of forced sterilizations. Um, and so, so the first case was documented in 1997, the first case that we have in our books, and the latest case was documented in May 2021. So this is something that has been going on for three decades, you know, and obviously undeterred, so to speak. And uh, okay, how do I get involved? Uh, well, I'm one of the victims. Um, I was sterilized in the 1990s, late 1990s. I was 22 years old, old and I'm also living with HIV. So um, you find anger <laughs> and, and what I'm saying, because you know, I believe that the personal is, is, is political. So I have to you know, also you know, put my personal identity out there. Okay, so why does this happen? Uh, why has it continued for, for this long? We think it's because of the AIDS policy, the global AIDS policy to be precise, right? Which, you know, initially promoted the prevention of mother to child transmission, again, presented as reproductive health, right? So this was a program that was saving babies from mothers who had HIV. So if you were a woman living with HIV, you are pregnant, you are going to be given treatment just before you give birth to save your baby, your baby gets taken out and the baby's given treatment and you are no longer given treatment, treatment, right? And you had to do the C-section. It was compulsory for you to do the C-section to maximize the chances of, you know, having a baby that does not have HIV. You know, and obviously in a country where, um, you know, women's issues were left like that and then you see forced sterilization coming this side, now you have given access, you have given doctors access to women's wounds, right? And what do you expect them to do? You know, they're going to cut something to try and, 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 and save the world. You know, and obviously if they cut women living with HIV, women living with HIV belong, you know, were, were women who are rather at the very bottom ladder uh, of, um, you know, status in society. So it really, you know, doesn't really matter. You know, and obviously, because the prevention of mother to child transmission was a research project, you know, you then had organizations that were funding those projects, you know, PEPFAR, you know, in, in, in particular, you know, and there's a lot of research, you know, that is out there about the impact of sterilization on PMTCT and, and, and all of that, right? Then you pass the phase where they were saying, oh, we're sterilizing you because we don't want you to continue to produce and leave orphans, you know, and then you ask a question that says, well, if I'm going to die in six months, you are wasting the state money. Why are you sterilizing me? Why do you want me to die with this operation? I'm going to die, I'm not going to conceive, right? So, so we passed that phase and then there was a phase of the AIDS treatment, right? Um, where there was now uh, HIV treatment, you know, but then sterilization continued. And in that phase, this is what happened. I mean, immediately, you know, there was AIDS treatment at a global level because all these policies are coming from the globe and they come, you know, down to the countries. There was then a project of integrating sexual and reproductive health services into HIV services. You know, this is a program that is coming from UNAIDS, you know, UNFPA, WHO, and mm -hmm. UN Women, uh, you know, as one of the co-sponsors, although it's not clear whether they have a role or not. So they are now integrating you know, and back to your first question, when you look at this integrating, integration, they actually are just integrating um, um, uh, contraceptives, you know, and countries are subjected to targets now, right? They must produce targets, you know, then sterilizations goes up, uh, forced contraceptions also goes up. Mm -hmm. You then have the broad uh, South African um, uh, reproductive health policies, right? Uh, the 2012 policy and the 2018 policy, you know, so those policies, when you look at them, they target two population groups, HIV positive women and um, young women and, and adolescent girls, you know, obviously that are poor and 
have high exposure, vulnerability to, to HIV infection. So those um, are the target. You know, similar situation with our national strategic plan on, on HIV. I mean, it basically says that by year 2027, you know, it's like 75% of HIV positive women and young uh, women, you know, and, and, and girls should be using uh, contracept contraceptives. You know, so that also drives, mm. you know, for sterilizations of HIV positive women. Mm. Then, um, so when we started off, it was 22 women, it became 48, and today it is, um, it's, it's over 80, it's about 85. Mm -hmm. You know, then on the statistic sides of things, we think- Thomas, Thomas thousands, just one thing, just one thing, because we are already kind of um, progressing in our time. Okay. Just that, because I have a few questions left for Andrea as well, but, uh, Please continue to uh, to uh, to continue your point, of course. And I also wanted to say thank you so much for sharing that with us, because that is a um, I when we talked uh, and when I looked into the topic of um, forced sterilization in South Africa and specifically your bio, um, and what you have already done with uh, her rights initiative, it was um, incredibly impressive and. Um, that's why I wanted also to give this topic a lot, um, a bigger platform so that you speak on this at depth and for us to understand why um, HIV policy has become, has, has, has evolved in this in such a way and why it is targeting these, um, these parts of the population. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, please, uh, if, you want to, can, if you want to add um, more to your point, you can do so feel free, free. I didn't want to interrupt. I just wanted to remind uh, remind you of the time. Um, that's all. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for that. Okay, so in, in, in terms of numbers, I'm, I'm talking about this because it comes out a lot. We think there are thousands um, of HIV positive women who have been forced into sterilizations in South Africa. The Human Sciences Research Council uh, in 2015 15 released a study called the HIV AIDS Stigma Index. The study is commissioned by UN AIDS, the South African government, um, the National AIDS Council and many other international sponsors and or donors. So this study um, released that 7.4% uh, of about 6,000 women living with HIV they interviewed reported that they'd been forced into sterilization in the past 12 months. So those would be the sterilizations that happened uh, between 2013 and 2014, 7.4. Uh, we have a population of about 4.2 million women living with HIV in this country. Um, and the same study uh, revealed that 37% uh, of the women, women living with HIV who participated report, reported that they'd been forced into taking a contraception. Um, and uh, what this, yeah. Yeah, That's what these findings basically meant is that, okay, so forced sterilization is not just a bad behavior of bad doctors. It's something that is systematic, you know, it's clearly targeted and it's a well-oiled uh, state uh, machinery. Um, so, yeah, so we've been um, engaged in this work for almost 14 years, uh, seeking justice for the women, working with different partners, uh, mainly the Women's Legal Center, who are our legal uh, representatives, you know, so, you know, all the advocacy, all the influencing has basically not worked. Um, and we are now preparing for a case that will go into a case, a court of law, a class action uh, case. Um, and what we've been doing to support this case is, you know, research, uh, like it's a long story, but I'll try to condense it, you know, because for years we'll speak to the state and the state will say, well, what you're talking about is anecdotes, right? We will listen to you, we will act on this matter if you present it to us as research, you know, which is why activists like myself and others found ourselves in universities to say, oh, well, if there's power in the academy, we, we want to be there. And women who began to assist us in the academy would said, you know, said, you know, you, you better do that. You know, so we've done like research uh, on the topic and we're currently busy with uh, three studies as we prepare for, 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 for the court. So one study is um, we are documenting, working with the University of South Africa to, you know, document the impacts of forced sterilizations on women 
from a feminist perspective, right? Because for us, it's not about the cut, it's not about the operation. It's about what happens to you, to your life, you know, thereafter, you know, how sterilization, forced sterilization intersects with your other identities and oppressions as a, as a, as a woman. We also are conducting a study that is documenting the mental health effects uh, of sterilization. It is um, one, yeah. one question, yeah. sorry, I, the, the dogs, um, I think are a little bit uh, interrupting. <laughs> um, I can't hear you very oh. well. <laughs> um, may I interrupt you here? And, um, and perhaps you can send, uh, share some links and information to the chat that would be amazing to find out more about what it is that you are currently doing with the class action uh, suit and um, how you are preparing for it. I, I hopefully I wish you all the luck um, and success with that. Um, I did have um, one question left for Andrea before I get into the questions. Um, Andrea, we haven't spoken enough about your e-paper and it is very, I think, as I said, it's a very timely topic, and I would love to talk about it um, still in this, uh, in this panel. Is the fact that what, what Promise has just described is, you know, the, these measures to control how a population grows and who, which people can grow. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's something that is also happening in Europe as well. And your e-paper, you've described the discourses in the European Union institutions that are leaning in, in, the, in the way of saying, we want to control the population uh, and the migration like that. And there, um, can you tell us a little bit about um, who, is, who, is, who is saying these things? Who is leading these discourses and um, why? Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. So this is our collective paper. Let me stress that. So this is uh, a work of four um, very dedicated uh, professionals. And uh, uh, I would uh, answer to this very important question in a way to say that uh, demography, uh, this word, is basically uh, recording certain facts. Right, so uh, related to death, birth, and moving, right? So these are the three uh, issues uh, demography is concerned. And uh, uh, population policies are built on demographical facts. Those facts, the demographers are actually presenting to policymakers. So that's why when we are talking about reframing this population policy, we have to go back to the basics. Namely, that what kind of facts are produced by whom and how. And uh, this is uh, this question which informed our paper. Namely, that we wanted to look at how the European level politicians, uh, decision makers, the commissioner herself, uh, the leaders of the different um, party families, those who don't know that in the European Parliament there are uh, so-called families, which is, I think, very telling as well that, uh, that they are voting together uh, according to the uh, joint um, uh, so-called values. So uh, what, how did they um, present facts? And uh, that somebody is dead right? That can be presented in so many different narratives. And population policy and the analysis of demographic facts are related to certain narratives. And that's where our paper came in and wanted to analyze how on Twitter, which is a very specific genre, a very specific space, but a very powerful space. And since Elon Musk just bought Twitter, it will get even more uh, powerful shaping the way how we think, how we get information, and how do we uh, talk about certain things. So, and demography is especially uh, the presentation of demographic facts, which is life, death, migration. They are very open for a kind of dramatic presentation that somebody is dead, 
you know, that's a sad thing. So, uh, and lots of uh, emotions are involved. And what we see now in this uh, analysis of the, uh, the Twitters, um, more than 6,000 uh, Twitters were, um, messages were announced, were ever analyzed, uh, that uh, this um, uh, narrative is used by the different uh, conservative and increasingly by the far right forces uh, more and more. And the far right is actually taking over this discourse and eating up the space, the narrative, what the conservatives have, they are basically appropriating, taking over this discourse on two different directions. The first is normalization. So they are normalizing certain uh, discourses via demography that you are afraid of something, you are scared of something. So it, it's uh, this, um, uh, concept of the great replacement is used by the far right that the European population will be replaced by others. And if you move from Europe, you know, this replacement that the Chinese are replacing what? So, I mean, that this kind of replacement is, um, is very much present in the, in the different far right discourses, the fear right? To normalize this fear that you are afraid of the change, you are afraid of somebody move, birth, death. So this is, uh, and demography is very open for this. This is uh, a kind of empty signifier in a sense. It's an empty category. These are facts which require a narrative to tell. And this narrative is actually hijacked. And the second is the the polarization. So these uh, 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 political parties are aiming for a conscious polarization. And this is a new phenomenon in our present politics that they are not uh, aiming for coalition or consensus, but they are aiming for polarization because polarization is a form of governance it's a modus operandi, and it actually somehow uh, covers the fact that these parties really do not have too many original ideas, but they are polarizing the others, creating their own group, and they are talking to the own group via pointing out that the enemy is the other group. And demography is a fantastic narrative tool to do this. And the population policy is also a fantastic narrative uh, tool to do this, especially because it's an empty signifier. It's, you know, it's a fact, right? And also because those concerns, namely that there are few children who were born or too many children were born or too few people are dead or too many people are dead. These are real concerns. I'm not saying that this is a real concern that there are too many people who were born, but it's a bodily experience. It's an issue of the of uh, of of actual issue. So uh, it's um, it's a material, really concerning issue. So that's why it's open for uh, hijacking and instrumentalization. So uh, therefore, I would say that the population policy and the demography policy, they are extremely important and timely nowadays became, because they became, again, a contested field, not only among professionals and those who are working on demography and population policy, but it is becoming a major field of politics and policy making. And that's that's why, and let me again say, it is so important to have this discussion. Thank you. Thanks so much, Andrea. I have a question from the yeah, audience. Okay. It was actually, oh, sorry. Yeah. No, I just wanted to comment one sentence, what you yes, said. Yes, please. Uh, what's important also for the German situation that uh, this hijacking is only possible of the far right. Uh, that's very, their, their terror is population policy. It's all about population. The history of uh, far right is connecting anti-feminism and racism and anti-migration policy. So it's biopolitics always. But the preparation of it was done by a lot of like seemingly progressive talks about 
pronatalist politics for middle classes, uh, reconciliation of working and uh, family and so on in Germany uh, by green and, uh, and, and social democrat governments and so on, they, they started with this discourse and I think we have already to start there. And one important issue is that it's always a nationalized discourse. Also in the development policies, it's always like uh, finging, like uh, very, making very simplistic arguments about national economy as if it would be a, a closed container, a national, uh, with national demography. And uh, all, already there, it starts to be a problem. Just too much comment. <laughs> Thank you so much, Susanne. Um, Andrea, we have received a, a, a private message from the audience. Um, I think that uh, kind of, uh, is a good following follow up question to that, which is um, right oriented governments in certain developing countries empower population growth as a tool of boosting nationalism. Uh, the, the commenter writes, um, where all the burden is on the woman, ideally having three or more children, despite the country's poverty. So this is kind of like a comment on population growth as a nationalist weapon, quote unquote, weapon. Um, have you also have you also observed uh, something like that happening in the discourses on democracy? Yes, uh, that's a very good uh, comment and a very good question to historicize this whole development. So uh, the uh, to connect the national uh, greatness with the number of. Uh, uh, citizens they have that goes back to the uh, 19th century uh, then um, uh, and especially to to Herder so to, to, to the German concept that you know the, the, the more people uh, uh, a country has uh, the more future and better perspectives this country has so therefore from this point onwards there was this uh, discussion of having uh, more and more so the, the uh, a kind of extensive uh, development of the of the uh, of the population, and that's also uh, 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 that also drove the uh, colonization and the colonial processes. But of course, here we have a problem that those who are on the colonies they have a different uh, skin color, and they are not necessarily uh, fit into this um, uh, image what the colonizer has. So therefore, certain policies needs to be uh, introduced to make sure that those are reproducing who are the desirable population, and. Also, uh, in the 20th century, uh, the Stalinist Soviet Union and Nazi Germany also had this kind of uh, uh, policies of um, uh, uh, creating um, uh, fr policy frameworks to encourage the desirable population to reproduce and the undesirable not to reproduce or to eliminate that particular uh, group. And that's why it's really important to underline the colonial uh, connection between those policies and, uh, uh, and the colonial processes from the, from the, from the 19th century. And uh, uh, also you see this very paradoxically present in illiberal states now. So if you look at Russia, uh, they are preparing uh, for uh, possibly banning the abortion because uh, as a militarized nation, they need more and more soldiers in the, in the future. Also, if you look at Hungary, uh, there are several policy measures in order to increase the number of Hungarians in the Carpathian Basin, which is also a kind of uh, uh, extensionist uh, policy. So this comment is really important because A, it gives a historical perspective, Secondly, because it gives an overview of uh, globally the connection between colonialism and also the population policies. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrea. Um, Susanna, there was a comment in the chat that I, well, I think it's a very provoc provocative question um, that I uh, saw that you had written about this, to be honest. Um, so the comment uh, goes, um, Kemi also mentioned the challenges of the sixth mass extinction of biodiversity and of wildlife and the planetary boundaries, which underpin the survival of homo sapiens. You have written about 
this, I would call this the very neo-Malthusian reflex, right? Uh, yeah. And we can we observe this a lot in the climate debate. Um, you have written about this as well. Could you could you could you speak to that? Yeah, I think it's a, a new way of again blaming the number of people for uh, for a system of production, a system of uh, fossil capitalism, a system of uh, uh, using uh, of, of uh, social nature relations, which is about uh, changing these relations, changing uh, um, extractivism and changing uh, um, fossil capitalism. And uh, if we look at the numbers of people, we also see that it's so uh, different uh, which countries are really uh, and which actors are really causing and the environmental destruction that's absurd i would say to make the number of people on this globe uh, responsible for that and it's uh, i think it's like a it's a kind of negating uh, the, the problem of, of climate change uh, if you look at numbers of people um, uh, instead of looking at the real uh, reasons of resource uh, distribution of extractivism and of also of the history of of also uh, genocide and uh, land uh, um, grabbing and all this uh, destructive uh, um, histories, uh, uh, this, this like um, fossil capitalism, the capitalism has done. So it's, I think it's like absurd to, to go in this direction. I know that there's some people also from climate uh, discourse saying we have to make a birth strike, but I think it's more a media phenomenon that really the movements are thinking about. Uh, I was asked recently or often about this, to say ah, there is a feminist uh, birth strike movement in the climate uh, movement and uh, th there is not really one. There is a lot of uh, young women saying, maybe I don't want to have children. Uh, that's a totally other uh, issue uh, because I want to engage in politics or because I have a dystopic view on the future. But that has nothing to do with uh, blaming numbers of people or making population discourse. And even there's one, uh, Birth strike activist who did this sometime in the UK, some singer, Pe uh, Pepino was called her name. She herself stopped this, her own campaign, saying that she didn't uh, think that the power of overpopulation discourse is so strong that some institutions like Population Matters and others, like this, this lobby groups who do this politics, uh, promise has described so well, uh, they uh, hijack also this uh, type of. Uh, Idea. So they said, no, the, the, we want to stop this discourse. So I think really uh, it's an eco terrorist right wing uh, uh, thing uh, that uh, we have to really take care of, that uh, maybe the right will uh, observe, uh, will hijack this discourse too, instead of negating climate change. And this should be our main uh, issue about it and to look at the real reasons of. Uh, production consumption patterns and changing right. of this global capitalism. Yeah. Mm. Thank you so much. Yeah, I guess, I mean, I understand the intentions behind statements such as we're running out of resources or uh, there's not enough to meet growing populations, but it's, a, it's also important to think about the victims of these statements, right? When we're talking about um, re resources running out, it's not because of population growth. No. Or, so but it's, it's a distribution. Mis <laughs> yeah, Such it's a mismanagement it. also of resources of who gets to um, spend, uh, waste, what, how much. Um, I guess uh, we also, this is a really great question for all of you at the end. Um, this is a, a question that we've received for uh, from also a, a private message. It's a very nice question. I love that because I also had that in my own list of questions for you, which is what are feminist strategies to make um, the racist and ableist um, classist backgrounds of population policies visible? How can we how can we fight back? How can we counter them? Promise, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, you're, you're mute. Promise. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, always a, a difficult question, um, you know, but for me, um, I think it's what we are exactly doing today or starting to do today to politicize it, right? And, and also to target the source, you know, and the source from where I'm seated is the, inter the international political economy, you know, where these things are, you know, developed, structured, where, where the real power you know, is, 
you know, and, and then begin to unpack, you know, as to, you know, where has it attached itself, you know, and how do we disrupt it at that level, right? You know, and understanding that if it's political, it also means it is systematic. Like um, uh, my colleague um, is talking about the institution of demography, you know, and I'm thinking that, you know, maybe, you know, you know, you, you target that institution and maybe also other research, um, you know, fields. I mean, for an example, I mean, here in South Africa, we see a very problematic relationship between biomedical uh, researchers and social scientists uh, uh, researchers. Um, you know, that you, so it's biomedical researchers, it's the funders in the West, you know, that are, you know, putting together all these studies and then these studies, you know, you know, come here and then the local researchers will supply population that will be, you know, the research and then social scientists, instead of raising, you know, their critical questions about the phenomena, you know, that they're presented with, their are focused and be, you know, becomes like focused on, you know, the behavioral aspects, you know? What is their, what are their beliefs? What is the behavior? And how can we use that to work for this particular uh, mm. program? You know, and also part of it is also building consciousness, feminist consciousness, you know, uh, on women themselves, um, you know, so that women claim their power. I think you can only claim your power if you are conscious and you have power to, to do so. You know, and also to challenge the role that women get assigned aid, you know, and in other spheres, you know, the, the role of care to say, it's appropriate that women are provided with the role of care, you know, all ought to be working with gender-based violence, for an example, you know, but actually, you know, women should be in a position where they are able to think, you know, look for change, strategic interest change, you know, change that will change gender relations in a more substantive manner, you know, so for me that that's what I would think needs to happen. Thank you so much. Andrea, Susanne, is there anything you would like to add? Yes, thank you. I think this is the $1 million question, as you would say. So uh, I started my contribution about the narrative, right? So there are certain facts of life, and how do you discuss that fact of life? And here I think feminist activism has got serious um, possibilities and serious responsibilities that how do you talk about certain issues and we are not powerless I would say because the concept of intersectionality was exactly developed uh, by Crenshaw 30 40 years ago uh, when she was trying to analyze statistical data about the prison population and recognize that there are some white spots. Some people are not visible, some are not represented. So we are not helpless in trying to uh, shape a kind of progressive uh, political framework of talking about these issues. But this kind of new narratives are, uh, we have a method, but these narratives are not coming from nowhere. And that's why we need uh, more dialogue between the academics and the practitioners, uh, because the academics are fine producing all these peer-reviewed papers, right? But how to translate all those peer-reviewed articles to political action, that is uh, a problem and that's uh, something we haven't done before. And in the present context, this is a major historical mistake that all that uh, feminist knowledge has not been uh, translated to action. And the knowledge production is not necessarily connected to the, um, uh, to the everyday experiences of uh, women. So therefore, this uh, kind of uh, new narrative will come from this uh, new dialogue, new forms of dialogue. One of this is this kind of uh, 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 webinar we are having now. And the third uh, issue, what I would like to raise beside uh, uh, having a critical intersectionality and to create a dialogue between academics and, uh, and um, uh, practitioners is uh, a new form of communication. Uh, this is not connected to the content, 
which we need to produce as feminist academics, but the way how we are communicating. And uh, uh, if, we, if you read the report, what we uh, did about the Twitter uh, accounts, you see that the far right is basically monopolizing the discussion. So, uh, and the progressive forces are not taking part of this particular exchange. So, uh, and although we have a lot to say, I would say, so uh, to participate in the discussions, go out and explain what are those problems uh, we are identifying and how to solve that uh, and get into a fierce dialogue and debate with the others. That's the only way how to disseminate uh, the ideas and to reach out for a wider uh, uh, population, demonstrating that there is an alternative. Because the most depressing finding in this report is that it, the alternative is not visible. Although the alternative is there. So I just would like to encourage all of us to think about these three points, about intersectionality, about the kind of cooperation and dialogue in knowledge production, and also a new form of communication, which is going out and very bravely uh, engages with uh, the, those who do not think the same way as we do. Because Thank if we so don't much. do this, then it will be, you know, has got serious consequences like a, a kind of a built in civil war. Thank you. I was talking too much. Sorry. Thank, Thank you, you so much. No, really valuable input, Susanna. The last, the last is yours. <laughs> yeah, thank you, thank you. Uh, you both already said a lot about it. I, I think maybe only to uh, to refer to Andrea. Um, what is really the challenge is not to go in the same direction, uh, making a different population discourse, but really to to oppose it, to question it, to de deconstruct it. Already, it's a very academic word. I think what reproductive justice um, activists all over the world are doing is exactly that, uh, deconstructing uh, this population discourse and showing what is about the crisis they want to solve via this uh, demographic discourses. And another thing I think we can learn from the reproductive framework as black feminists have uh, suggested and as you will debate here also is uh, to oppose both like this uh, feminist Northern uh, pro-choice idea of uh, how all women in the world have to uh, behave and how they should plan and time and space their, their, their children, <laughs> uh, opposing this as a colonial and a, as, an, uh, yeah, as a powerful discourse against all heterogeneous complex situations everybody is in. And on the other hand, also opposing like a right-wing uh, patriarchal, also sometimes uh, from, as you as, um, promised, told us about the ANC, also from some patriarchal uh, black uh, anti-imperial positions has been done uh, uh, and not seeing the interest of women. And now we can have to fight, we have to fight for access to abortion and safe and not harmful contraception and not this technical um, hormonal contraception, but there's a lot of other possibilities. We had to have to fight for it, but in the in a broad framework of basic healthcare and that has nothing to do with all these development goals they are putting over it. And that's my third thing we have in <laughs> um, Germany really to oppose development, uh, narratives, development institutions, and also pharmaceutical industry uh, who are working together and really to look close on these issues. And it's still, there's such a lot of debate on assisted reproduction and a lot of other issues, but uh, contraceptives and uh, how they are uh, uh, yeah, part of this game and how they are in implemented in a coercive way. Uh, there's very, very few exchange. And I think we have to go on with this exchange with people like Promise and other movements to know about more about it, what happens. Thank you so much, Susanne. I think you've just, there was a perfect uh, transition to what I was going to say, because on May 10, we will exactly talk about contraception. Um, that's our next discussion, uh, May 10. But I want to say thank you so much to all three panelists. I think this was an extremely, extremely insightful uh, panel for me, at least. I hope it was the same for you. Um, thank you so much for sharing your uh, research and uh, your expertise. Thank you so much, Promise, Andrea, Susanne. 
Um, and thank you to the audience and your questions. And I hope we get to see each other again on May 10 um, uh, on reframing contraception. <laughs>